Thanks, Anya, for the nice introduction. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be uh, speaking in front of a society that was uh, funded uh, 200 years ago or so. Uh, that's really amazing. Uh, and there is actually a nice uh, connection that I, that I want to make that I, you know, sometimes don't make in the same way. So uh, there will be a, a particular twist um, to today's presentation. So I have to explain to you now uh, how to make images uh, of, of a black hole. Um, and um, in fact, it's something that uh, people have been thinking about for a very long time. Uh, it's, uh, it turns out that one of the first ideas that, uh, that I'm aware of um, that in the end have to do with the concept of a black hole, namely an object or a star or whatever you want to call it, that pulls in light and doesn't allow light to escape. That is an idea uh, 200 years old. Uh, by, by Mitchell, uh, a British, uh, British physicist who thought about this um, for you know, uh, a very long time. Uh, and only, I guess, 100 years and 200 years later, we, we are arriving at these additional milestones of first Einstein establishing uh, an actual theory behind all of this that, uh, that contains black holes as a mathematical, well-defined solution. You know? And then another 100 years forward, um, it took to, um, to generate this first ever image. Uh, of such an object. And I'd like to talk about the image and how, how to generate such an image, so to give you a better appreciation of what it takes. Uh, it turns out that there's a whole range of um, diverse expertise that is required. Um, and I also want to touch on some theoretical aspects uh, and why we believe it is a black hole and hopefully say something about what it all means and, and what it takes uh, if you want to look beyond the pretty picture. So uh, here we go. Uh, you see a couple of pictures and animations. Uh, I cannot resist but to say also a few words about uh, M87, which was uh, the first uh, ever image. Um, and uh, last year, uh, uh, we, we were able to finally uh, also publish uh, the picture that we took uh, in the same year. So the data was from the same year, 2017, but it took us three more years uh, to get that uh, second picture uh, of the black hole in our Milky Way. Uh, and I owe you an explanation for why it took us uh, three years longer, I think. Uh, you see in the, in the animation that is, uh, that is running um, how light travels around the black hole. And that's one of the reasons why these pictures are so fascinating. Uh, we all have seen pictures that are, from an aesthetic point of view, more beautiful. Uh, but these images have their impact uh, because of what we are seeing in this picture. In particular, why uh, the interior of this donut-shaped emission is dark. It is because light from that region uh, does not escape the black hole. It is that connection with theory that makes these pictures so profound. Uh, it is not uh, their aesthetical uh, beauty. I also want to mention, um, uh, towards the end of the talk, um, there is a very strong instrumentation uh, effort uh, which needs to be funded, you know, and, uh, and there's a lot of fantastic facilities around the world um, that make this possible. Um, it is not only the telescopes, as I will emphasize. There is a lot of uh, algorithmic development. There's a lot of theoretical work by a lot of people um, with very diverse expertise. Um, but I do want to stress, uh, in particular, of course, ESO's uh, involvement uh, in this process. Uh, you see a picture of uh, the Apex telescope there, which is one prototype of 64 additional ones that are 100 kilometers away or so in the Atacama Desert which provide the best uh, telescope that we have uh, in the array and that makes this all possible. So with that being said, uh, let's, uh, let's get right into it. If the slides will change, um, hold on, I'm sure they will, there we go. So um, I'd like to really get into three main uh, questions. Uh, one is I want to actually explain to you how such an image is taken, uh, how we arrive at that image. It turns out it is much more complicated than just uh, you know, pulling out your smartphone and holding it onto your, uh, your source of interest uh, and press a button. Uh, so I would like to explain to you a little bit at least uh, what's behind uh, just taking that image alone. And then in the second part, I want to tell you why we believe what we're seeing is a black hole. Uh, after all, it doesn't come with a little label attached, I am a black hole, so we have to figure that out uh, for ourselves. Uh, and then third, um, and I guess more general, um, an expansion of the point two is uh, what it all means. Um, and I want to emphasize how important it is that theory is uh, matching uh, observations uh, in this tech. This is the moment when, when I think uh, scientific insights uh, are, are gained, um, regardless of whether it's uh, in astronomy or, uh, or in other areas um, of, of research. 
Uh, and so, yeah, well, we're getting into all of this. Um, and and I, will, I will mention here that uh, this particular connection to, of course, uh, uh, Erster's work uh, is that the reason that these black holes are shining and do provide a little bit of light <laughs> um, is that um, the infalling gas into the black hole is, um, uh, is subject to a very strong magnetic field. And this magnetic field, and only through this magnetic interaction, uh, are these charged particles radiating. Uh, they happen to radiate in the radio, uh, and only because of that understanding of electromagnetism are we able to, uh, to see the source and also to make sense of what happened in the source um, and, and understand what we are seeing. So, uh, so it's really, uh, uh, in some sense, uh, Oster's legacy, you could say, that, that black holes, or at least these black holes, are shining. All right, uh, so let's get into it. Um, how do we make an image? So let me start with the easier case. There was a good reason um, why in um, soon after 2017, after the observations were done, uh, the entire collaboration focused on the M87 data. Uh, that is a galaxy um, not too far away um, in our cosmic neighborhood, an elliptic galaxy, M87. And, um, and it took us uh, about two years um, to, to publish this very first image. And that was a major, major breakthrough. Um, the whole collaboration was working for that goal for such a long time, um, including some of the pioneering works as early as the 90s, uh, you know, um, when, I, when I was still in high school and learning fractional calculus, maybe. Uh, so there's a whole generation of, um, of researchers that has passed. And then with the same observational data from the same observation campaign, um, we took another three years um, to publish Sagittarius A star. And today in this talk, I want to get a little bit into why it took us so much longer. Uh, it turns out there are very, very good reasons for that. And I, think, uh, and I think I can explain that without too much technical detail. Now that we're done, um, which is of course a massive relief, um, we, uh, we, can, we can enjoy a little bit um, the, um, the success that we've had and, and the impact it has now on science and also the public. Um, and we can see in particular in the science domains that a lot of different areas of theoretical research, for example, uh, are starting to look into images of black holes who haven't done this before. And also we're, we're really, it goes way beyond black hole science, way beyond astrophysics um, that these images um, are, are relevant for. Uh, and I think uh, this collage of newspapers around the world also demonstrates something we notice in the, so in the social media feeds as well. And uh, when, I, when I look at, at the audience here, it's a, it's a black holes are a topic that fascinate a lot of people across uh, across all different ways you can, you can slice uh, through, uh, through, uh, uh, through society. You know, it doesn't matter uh, uh, wh where you're from. We have, it, we have reactions from, from everywhere on the globe, uh, all the ages and ethnicities and so on. Everybody's fascinated by these objects, uh, I think because they're so mysterious uh, and because they, um, they challenge our intuition, uh, I think, like, like nothing else. Um, that's at least the reason why I'm so interested in them. So, so how do you take an image of a black hole? Let's, let's take a simple step first, um, and let's think about a couple of general things we need. First of all, we, this is a point that gets often overlooked. Um, you first of all want an unobstructed view to the source. Uh, that seems very obvious, um, but it turns out for the black holes that we're looking at, that is one of the major things that, uh, uh, that makes this very difficult. The highest resolution we normally get, if we think about optics, uh, is actually not in the radio. It's in, in, in the high energy X-rays, gamma rays, and so on. Uh, but this is not where we have uh, a clear view all the way to the black hole. We need an electromagnetic wavelength that allows the photons to go all the way from near the black hole horizon all the way to our telescope. So it has to make the journey through the entire universe. It has to go through our atmosphere of our home planet, which is very tricky. It's a very sad story in a way. They get, you know, these photons get generated right next to a black hole. They manage to escape somehow, make it through the universe with all its dangers. And it comes to Earth and a tiny water droplet in our atmosphere uh, can be the end of it. Uh, it's, really, it's really amazing. Uh, so the observing wavelength needs to be right so that we see the black hole. That's one reason we're using one millimeter wavelength. Uh, the other comes from resolution. The other thing you need is you need sufficient resolution to resolve 
the, 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 the image of the black hole on the sky. Now for the two largest black holes that we know of on the sky, M87 and Sagittarius A star, um, we need a tremendous amount of angular resolution. And I'll show you a little bit more quantitatively how good that has to be. But you need to, you, you need to have um, the angular resolution to resolve the source. And that also pushes you, as we will find out, into the same wavelength, uh, about one millimeter. Uh, and, to, and the use of, of a very long baseline interferometry, which I will have to explain to you. The other thing is you need sensitivity. Uh, even if you can resolve uh, the source in principle, uh, and you can calculate that on a piece of paper, um, you need enough sensitivity. And that means you need a lot of telescopes, you need large telescopes, and you need very efficient telescopes. Um, and, uh, and even if you have done all of those things, um, the technique you're using is relying on very clever algorithms that make sense of what we call very sparse data. So um, I, will, I will explain this in a few slides, but um, the measurements we take are not very direct. They're very different from the, from the smartphone picture. Um, we're taking very abstract data sets that have to be um, analyzed um, with sophisticated algorithms to come up with an image that is consistent with that data set. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of brain power involved as well. It's not just big, big telescopes, a lot of data. It's also uh, ingenuity and human creativity. All right, um, so let's, let's talk about this a little bit more in detail. Um, so it's, it's kind of like the same situation when you, when you had an accident. I, I hope, of course, that doesn't happen to you, but if, if you happen to have a, a broken bone, uh, you will not go to the airport um, to these uh, security scanners uh, to find out whether your bone is broken or not. Why is that? Because they're using one millimeter wave technology and they will bounce off the water um, on your skin. That's why they're using one millimeter as a wavelength. They want to see, they want to check underneath your clothes, are you hiding something? If you want to know whether your bones are broken, you have to go to the x-rays because the x-rays are penetrating your skin, bouncing off your bones, and therefore you get a picture of what you're interested in. It's the same here, except that um, going all the way to the black hole for us means that we are using a wavelength of one uh, millimeter or so. Uh, the resolution that we need uh, turns out to be 40 micro arc seconds. Now, for some of you, that micro arc seconds is not a very uh, tangible unit. Um, so let me, let me try to break that down for you in multiple ways. You can think of it as putting two golf balls right next to each other, placing them on the moon, and then look at them from Earth. The angle between the left-hand side of the left golf ball and the right-hand side of the right golf ball, as viewed from Earth, is about 40 micro arc seconds. So that's the kind of aiming exercise that you have to do. It's very, very precise, okay? And um, if you don't like the analogy of golf balls on the moon, you can also try to read a newspaper uh, when you are standing in LA uh, and the newspaper is in New York City. I don't know which one's more intuitive, but, um, but you get the idea, it's difficult. Um, if you want to work out what that means, uh, for your telescope. Um, okay, now you know the angular resolution delta theta, uh, and it's pretty easy to work out um, what wavelength uh, and uh, aperture uh, you need. Um, and it turns out that the diameter of your telescope has to be roughly the size of the planet. And that is very difficult uh, because building these telescopes bigger and bigger, you can imagine at some point their own weight is going to cause them to bend and to collapse and so on. So that's hard. And this is where the idea of interferometry is coming in. It turns out you don't actually have to build a telescope the size of Earth. That would be better uh, from an analysis point of view. Um, but you can circumvent these difficulties in building such a big radio dish by connecting the light from various existing radio telescopes uh, around the planet. And you can observe the source um, coherently at the same time and, uh, and track the data. And if you do that right, and I'll get into a little bit more detail, you can actually use that data and generate an image from that. And the resolution you get is not any more determined by the diameter D of the telescope, but by the distance between the telescopes. So the further away the telescopes are, the higher your resolution. Uh, and while you cannot build a radio telescope the size of Earth, you can certainly put two radio telescopes as far apart as roughly an Earth diameter. So that's how we are we're getting our enormous resolution of 40 micro arc seconds. Uh, and to give you another view on what that resolution is, let me place another object on the surface of the moon, not two golf balls. Oh, sorry. 
Well, let's try that again. We're zooming in uh, again from Earth. That was the Atacama Desert. We're zooming into the moon. And as we're zooming in, you're going to see an object that has also roughly the size of 40 micro seconds. And I think that zoom in is going to show you even more how small that angle is that we need to observe on the sky. And finally, there it is. A nice little donut. Or as they say in the US, a Danish. Yeah. All right. If you think that golf ball analogy is weird, I keep emphasizing to people there are two golf balls on the moon. Okay? And that's what happens when you send US astronauts uh, to the moon. Now, when they're done with the mission, they play golf. So there are two golf balls on the moon. All right, uh, interferometry. So this business of combining light from different telescopes is a very old idea, actually, uh, from the 60s or so. Um, and the idea is that um, if you put these telescopes together, um, various telescope pairs are probing different um, patches in the image. And it's a little bit like an interferometer, um, like a double slit experiment. Um, but the more antennas you have, the clearer the picture. I want to explain to you a little bit better how that image is generated. So let's take uh, an example. This is taken from a, from a bachelor student of mine who, uh, who came up with this ver very nice picture of looking at it. What you see um, on, uh, on the right is, uh, is a reconstructed image using that technique. Um, so this is a very classic uh, radio source um, that I just picked as an example, or that Lasse picked as an example. And you can see here, these are the kinds of um, uh, views that we have with the VLBI array. It's in this Fourier space. And in a perfect world, where the entire Earth's surface would be covered in radio telescopes, um, then we would have access to all the information and we could easily transform to get our image. In reality, we only have eight telescopes. So we have uh, only very limited access uh, to that information in these grayscale pictures. And you can see these blue dots in these examples are the areas uh, of Fourier space that we cover. So it's very little compared to everything. If you throw away uh, the information uh, on, uh, on large scales, that's shown in the second row, then you can see that you end up with a picture that has very little to do with the true picture. You see all these little details, maybe not even those because of the lighting, um, but, um, but you don't see the general structure. Conversely, if you only look at the nearby telescopes and you don't have any telescopes that are far away, you end up with a lower line and you see a pretty blurry picture um, with uh, insufficient detail. So you want both. You want telescopes that are nearby, you want telescopes that are um, far away, and anything in between. Uh, a, a large spread in distances between telescopes, then you can generate a, a very good image reconstruction. So how does it work? Um, imagine you have radio waves traveling through the universe, and it's very good to assume that there are plane waves, everything's so far away in astronomy. And now these plane waves are arriving on Earth, and they will hit different telescopes at slightly different times. So you see all these wave fronts are coming in, and what you want to do is you want to observe the same wavefront with the different telescopes. So what you need to figure out is what is the time delay uh, between this telescope seeing a particular wavefront to this telescope over here. And the only way we can do that uh, with these techniques is to timestamp every flux measurement we make at every telescope with an atomic clock. It turns out you have to have a precision of a few tens of nanoseconds or so. Uh, and that makes this technique so demanding on storage size, uh, as you will find out in a few slides time. We start out, the observing night in 2017 produced about, uh, I think, 10 petabytes of data. Um, and that is an enormous amount of data that's located at the telescopes, including the South Pole, including Greenland now, not in 2017, but later. And it took us a long time to get that data to our supercomputer where we can actually correlate the signal. And the fastest way for us to do that was to literally pick up the hard disks, put them in a plane, and fly them to the supercomputer. It's much faster than the internet connection. Um, and that's how we ended up doing that. Um, in the EHT correlator, which is a supercomputer, um, this data is essentially, you're trying to figure out what is the time delay between these telescopes, and only then do you have an idea whether this all worked. Uh, and this was six months after the observations were taken. 
it's very difficult to fly out of the South Pole. Uh, turns out uh, there are very strong winds and it takes uh, three months or so uh, until our colleagues from there are allowed to get out. Um, so this is a natural delay that occurs all the time. And even then, uh, do you have to process 10 petabytes of data, which takes an enormous amount of time. However, when you're done with that, uh, then you reduce the data from petabytes roughly to gigabyte size or so uh, at this stage. Uh, and then you can start the calibration procedure where we begin to understand systematic uncertainties of our measurement and the data gets reduced more and more. Uh, and only with this calibrated data set do our imaging algorithms work. And at the end, you produce a picture that is, um, you can download it from the web uh, and look at the file size. That's probably a few kilobytes in size. Uh, so you could say that uh, most of what we measured uh, is, uh, is actually just noise, you know. Uh, but that's the only way you can get it done. So it's an enormous reduction of data, uh, uh, about 12 orders of magnitude or so. Um, now I want you to, to look at this um, from an observer's point of view. So how does an observing night uh, look like? The Earth is rotating, and that turns out to be extremely important for this technique. You can see here, we are looking at, in this case, um, we're looking towards M87, but uh, you, can, you can have a similar picture for Sagittarius A star. And you see as the Earth is rotating, uh, you see how different telescopes uh, along the planet are seeing the source. Uh, so every time you see a line pop up here, that means that two different telescopes have simultaneous visibility to M87, okay? And every time that happens, uh, our data gets filled in. Uh, at the beginning, we only have these two data points, and then Earth is rotating, and as it rotates, um, we are measuring different structure on the sky. So if our home planet would not be rotating, we could not have pulled off that measurement. We would have needed many, many more telescopes uh, to probe other areas of the image. So Earth's rotation is, is of great help in filling out this, uh, this data space. Uh, and then if you want to dig a little bit deeper here, um, these data points over here are probing very large scale structure in the image. And these data points over here probe very detailed small scale structures in the image. And what you see on the very right is how these imaging algorithms are taking this data here and reconstructing uh, this image as you go. At the beginning of the observing night, you almost have no data and the image looks very strange and, and the algorithms cannot figure out what's going on. So you need to wait for the Earth rotation to fill in all that data. Uh, and only if you have access to a couple of hours at least of observation, then uh, do the image algorithms finally converge on, on this ring-like structure uh, that we saw on the sky. All right, uh, so that was a lot. Um, let us go back to the Atacama Desert. Um, the ALMA telescope is composed of 64 individual telescopes, has a huge collecting area. And now we're taking a, uh, a journey through space, first towards uh, M87 star, and I have another uh, animation for, um, for Sagittarius A star. I hope the pictures are reasonably clear. Um, we will go through a sequence of actual observations. So this is, uh, this is no artist impression stuff. These are real um, pictures taken with uh, the Hubble telescope in this case. And then we go to radio observations um, of increasing frequency. And all these higher resolutions didn't see the shadow until the Event Horizon Telescope achieved this 40 micro arc second resolution. And for the first time, this blob didn't get brighter and brighter and brighter as we moved in, but finally, we saw this dark patch in the interior, which is what Einstein predicted um, how black holes should look like. It is this area where photons cannot escape the gravitational pull of the black hole. That was the key signature that we were after. So now finally, to Sagittarius A star. Why did it take three years after we've uh, done the job on M87? It turns out there's a much harder case. Uh, the size of the black holes uh, is scaling with their mass. So that means the heavier, uh, um, the, the, the larger. So Sagittarius A star is, um, is appearing larger than M87, but actually the mass of Sagittarius A star is much smaller. That has a number of um, uh, disastrous consequences for us. If you think about the typical time that it takes for anything, things, to move around the black hole, uh, that also scales with the mass. The heavier, the larger, and the slower. So Sagittarius A star changes its appearance on the sky much faster 
than M87. For M87, this change is roughly seven to eight hours. It's not an exact science, but that means if you look at it um, for an entire observing night, it's a good assumption that M87 stays the way it is, more or less. For, for Sagittarius A star, that's a terrible assumption. That changes on 20 seconds. Uh, and so this nice trick that I demonstrated to you a few slides ago of using Earth rotation to fill up um, our, our data uh, doesn't work anymore, at least not in this simple picture. Um, so we lost effectively a lot of our information and we had to get creative on the analysis side uh, and we did. We identified three completely new pathways um, to, to use this VLBI technique in a case where the source is rapidly changing. Uh, and that's one of the main reasons why it took so long. This was uh, something that people have never done before uh, and it needed to be invented uh, and finally we got it done. Uh, there is also one other problem. Uh, there is significantly more gas um, between us and Sagittarius A star. For M87, it's, it's a much more empty uh, part of the sky, but the view to Sagittarius A star is disturbed significantly by inhomogeneities in, uh, in electron distributions and so on, and that causes the radio waves to be uh, disturbed quite a bit. All of these things we had to battle with. Um, now, if I show you the data that we measured or something similar, um, it looks like this. So, so you, you, you measure your data and instead of just being um, a nice stable configuration, as the observing night goes on, the data points like wobble around. Uh, and here I've just taken a theoretical model. This has nothing to do with reality, but we've just taken a, a GR MHD simulation, a turbulent plasma, and you can turn this into an image, how it would look like on the sky. And what you find is that everything is bouncing around and everything's changing. And if you assume in your analysis that the data is not changing, you introduce an error and the analysis will be biased. So for example, if we then go and apply our standard M87 style analysis and we come out and write a paper about the ring diameter, for example, uh, we would be off. Um, that's very common in these analysis schemes. The true value for this model is here. And uh, our analysis, making the wrong assumption about assuming the source is static, comes up with a different conclusion because we introduced an error. We, did a, we made an assumption that is, not, that is not valid. So we needed to, um, to greatly um, uh, appreciate that and also expand our analysis to allow the data to be variable. Here you can see this uh, with actual data. So this is uh, the Sagittarius A star data on uh, the different days, uh, April 5, April 6, 7, and 10, uh, and in low frequency and high frequency band. Uh, this is what low and high stand for. And you can see um, the red data points are cycling through an individual data set. Uh, you can see that these data sets are obviously changing. Um, and that in itself was a big success. It was also a big uh, annoyance for us uh, that we had to that we had to figure all this out, but it was also at the same time a clear demonstration that we see variability on black hole horizon scales. Think about that for a second. That's a real tremendous achievement. We see things in the plasma change on time scales uh, that can only be explained by a, a really compact object like a black hole. All right, let's take the same journey, but this time to Sagittarius A star. It's a much better studied source, very nearby, uh, only a couple of, you know, 7,500 7, parsec away. Um, and you can see visually, like going into the Milky Way, how much more uh, stuff is in the way. We're going through uh, various observations again. And, um, uh, and of course, here we have uh, other very important observations of stars orbiting the center, which I will also get into in a bit. Uh, and again, we're, we're zooming in very, very far. And with EHT resolutions, finally, uh, this blob um, finally gets resolved into this image that still shows a dark region in the interior and has, interestingly, a somewhat different um, morphology. Looks a little bit like three bright blobs. I wouldn't take that too seriously uh, because our analysis clearly shows in the, in the data that uh, this is um, very sensitive to very particular assumptions we make in the imaging algorithms. It's also sensitive to which data we pick, like if I, we have observed it on four different days. So um, we published data on two of them, 
And, you know, depending on how you weigh things, uh, we're seeing an average image. And it's not surprising that there's some differences. So these three blobs, I wouldn't, I wouldn't overinterpret, let's say. Okay, um, now getting to the question of how do we know that what we're seeing is a black hole? Now in Sagittarius A star, uh, there is a tremendous amount of history behind studying the source at various different wavelengths with very different techniques, including spectral information and so on. Uh, and all of that leads to a very complete theoretical picture of what the source is and what the source cannot be and so on. And people have been arguing for a very long time that what we are seeing there cannot be an ordinary star um, for, for several reasons. But, um, but it takes independent observations, in particular this um, orbiting stars, but also a lot of theoretical work um, to convince yourself that what you, what you are looking at is a black hole or is a mission from near the black hole. Uh, and then at the end of this analysis and taking into account the independent observations, it turns out that black holes are not only consistent uh, with, with everything that we're seeing, it's also the most in conservative interpretation. It's the only object that uh, we know of that is stable on timescales of decades or so, uh, and that produces the necessary gravity to hold the stars in place, and that uh, doesn't produce more radiation. Okay, so uh, black holes are not the final answer though. That's another way you can look at it, because black holes, um, as we know them in general relativity, they have a singularity. You know, if you look at the mathematical solution, there is a there is a one over zero in there somewhere. So singularities don't sound very physical. Uh, so we don't really know uh, what is the way past that. Hopefully, quantum gravity will solve it one day. Uh, but there is um, this is not the final answer. Uh, I think this is very important. When we sometimes say it's a black hole and so on, it sounds like we have a complete understanding of what that is. But, uh, you know, that's not quite right. Now, um, I mentioned the orbit orbiting stars quite a few uh, times. Um, since 19, early 1990s, um, people have been tracking the orbital evolution of a cluster of stars near Sagittarius A star. This is on much larger scales, a thousand times larger than, than the EHT image. But you can see this particular star, S2, you briefly saw there, um, has completed an entire ellipse at this point, a lot more actually these days. Um, and from that ellipse in Kepler's third law only, you can make an estimate of the mass of the black hole. Uh, they didn't see the black hole, uh, but they saw in this crosshair, let me play the animation again, there's this little crosshair in the middle, and that is where the gravitational, the, 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 the center of mass has to be that holds these stars in place. Um, so they don't see any emission from there, but clearly it has to have uh, a few million times the mass of the sun uh, to produce the gravity to hold the stars in place. So if you don't see any emission, not in the radio, not in the x-ray, not in the optical, you don't see anything, uh, you cannot put a star there, you know, because a star would shine uh, and they don't see any emission from there. It's one of the biggest uh, reasons um, why we thought there was a black hole and now the image is providing independent proof of that. These uh, long-term observations were awarded with a Nobel Prize uh, in 2020. Um, and um, in the citation of this Nobel Prize, uh, there was actually the statement that observations with the EHT will be very important uh, to confirm this finding further. Now here's the spectral energy distribution that just shows you that Sagittarius A star has been studied extensively. So we know a lot about the source. And when I say it doesn't emit any light, um, I really mean that it is very, very dim. Uh, and we've, we've really tried um, over a very, very long uh, range and frequencies that there is just not a lot of light coming from this source. So it is very dark. Let me go a bit more quantitative. Um, together with Don Pesci, I led uh, uh, paper four out of six uh, collaboration papers on the source. And uh, this particular paper was focused on um, measuring the variability that we're seeing, uh, quantifying the morphology that we're seeing in the image, um, and uh, estimating the black hole mass. Now, this is something uh, that turned out to be uh, pretty tricky because it really pushed the telescope um, to its limits. Um, we believe that to make really firm measurements of the variability, perhaps generate a movie of the black hole one day, requires more telescopes so that we can form an image faster, that we don't have to wait um, for hours and hours of observing. 
So we were really in a situation where we could see the variability in the data, but we couldn't image it. We didn't have enough telescopes to really form a movie. Uh, and so we ended up characterizing that amount of variability. And despite the variability, we were able to estimate a mass um, of the black hole. Um, we measure an angular diameter of that, of that ring using various different methods. Um, and we then compare to the stellar observations uh, that you saw on the previous slide. And we reach a uh, very similar conclusion. We're not as accurate as them. Um, it turns out that Kepler's law is a fantastic tool. It allows you to make very precise measurements of the mass. Uh, we're not that lucky, um, but our measurements are um, on a much smaller scale. Uh, and so it's a very important confirmation and we hope to do better in the future. Now all of this work, and we only produced a pretty picture. Um, we haven't actually learned um, what it shows. Um, I haven't told you what we're seeing and why we're seeing it this way. Why does the black hole produce an image that has this ring-like structure? You know, and why are these blobs there and so on? Um, so we want to understand what we're seeing. And to put this in another way, you could say, what was going on in the source physically? Like what physical laws were in fact that produced the image that we see from far away? And this requires a lot of theoretical modeling. Uh, and all the physics that, that happens from the source all the way through the universe, potentially the atmosphere, and uh, into our telescopes. And here's another animation that shows you a theoretical model. Um, you see hot gas, hydrogen mostly, and you see a highly magnetized region shown in blue, uh, and the black hole is gray for whatever reason. Um, and you can see the material gets turbulent, it gets pulled in to the black hole, not everything, a lot makes it out. And this uh, magnetic region uh, is a site where particles uh, gain a lot of velocity and are getting expelled. Uh, just before they fall into the black hole, they, they manage to move away into the distance. And uh, you will see in a second that this uh, simulation, we're, we're turning the viewing angle very, very uh, slowly to give you a different view. And we turn it again to the angle that we believe matches the M87 case, uh, where we are almost staring down on the jet. And then we're going to turn this simulation of magnetized plasma, which a telescope cannot see, into an actual image. So we need to run the simulation output through a ray tracer that performs the radiative transfer that tells us what the synchrotron photons would look like that come from the source. And this is how it looks like. You see how much information goes out the window when you do that. Uh, and you see how bizarre uh, the image looks like. Um, all these different rings and filaments that are going on. And this still assumes that your telescope is perfect. Our telescope is not perfect. If it was, we would see this kind of stuff. But in a second, we will blur these images to the resolution we think we have with our telescope. And this is how it looks like. So you can see the enormous reduction in information. And from that, we need to conclude what we're seeing in the source. And so I think it is fair to say that uh, well, there's a lot that we have to leave on the table and uh, there's a lot to do in the future and we can improve. You know, it's, uh, this is only the first, the first of many steps, hopefully. And here again, uh, we have this um, more theorist point of view of what happens to photons around the black hole. And, and an explanation, I think, uh, is pretty compelling why we expect a ring on the sky. Imagine you have a light source behind the black hole. In reality, it's not just behind the black hole, of course. Uh, you have everything around the black hole uh, that, that lights up, but let's assume it's behind the black hole. If that's the case, light rays are getting bent by the black hole into your line of sight. So without the black hole, they would never hit your eyes, but because of the black hole, their trajectories are getting deflected and you see them. And that is why you get this focusing effect and you get this ring of emission that appears when you're looking at the black hole uh, from far away. It also tells you, if you play hide and seek in the universe, never hide behind a black hole because you, can, you, you will be seen all the time. You know? The worst place, worst place to be. Let me drill down a little bit more. Um, not all photons are created equally. Some photons like these, they get deflected a little bit by the black hole. You know, they, they come from somewhere, you know, and they, they get pretty close to the black hole. They produce sort of a ring-like image, but as you can see, it's pretty fuzzy. It's a lot of astrophysics, very messy. But there's some photons that get very close to the black hole. And the closer they get, 
the more they get deflected. And those are more interesting because they are getting very close to this ring of emission that we expect from theory. Uh, theoretical calculations, not too difficult actually, um, show that, um, that the photons that get really, really close to the black hole produce what is called a photon ring. And the photon ring is, um, is very, very um, interesting for us because it directly relates to the mass. So if you have a black hole that is twice as massive, it has a photon ring that is twice as massive. It's that simple. And that's effectively what we're trying to do. We measure an angular size on the sky, and that is directly related to the mass of the black hole. So we're weighing black holes by measuring their angular size. And uh, it's a little bit more complicated because we don't really see the black hole photon ring, but something very close to that. Right, so I showed you one simulation. One simulation that was probably running on two weeks and 500 cores or something. Um, but it turns out that that was one parameter set. Okay, we made one choice for the black hole spin. We could have made other choices. We made one choice for the mass, choices for the electron temperature, and I could go on and on and on. Um, what you have to do when you want to understand the physical conditions in the source is you want to go through, well, I could say all the possible parameter values. Um, you want to vary this a little bit. And you want to then see, okay, this model is working, this model is not working, it's not consistent with what we're seeing, and so on. For this purpose, we generated a library, this is frame 87, 60,000 model images, and uh, we asked ourselves, why does the image look like that, and, and which model is working, which one's not, and some were ruled out. For Sagittarius A star, this number exploded to a past one million, I think, because of the variability. It was so, so difficult. Um, but it's these kind of comparisons that allow us to make statements about what astrophysics is going on uh, in these sources. Uh, it's the only way we can infer the physical nature um, of the source. And uh, we believe continued observations um, with new data, with more telescopes, will improve these measurements. And we've arrived at a point in the Sagittarius A star analysis in particular, where the theoretical models that people have been working on for decades are being challenged. You know, there, it, it begins to look like uh, that there is maybe a bit of missing physics uh, in those models, which is very exciting. And a clear demonstration that these observations are, are pushing the envelope uh, of our understanding of these sources. Finally, um, getting back to the instruments that we're using, uh, and in particular highlighting ESO's contribution, uh, here's again a picture of the Apex uh, telescope, one dish that is like 64 more in the Atacama Desert. Um, that is an ESO contribution in the uh, uh, Chilean Desert, uh, Atacama, a very dry place on Earth, very high up, um, and we need these high elevation dry sites, uh, either high elevation or very, very cold, um, or both, uh, and that's, that has to do with um, the extreme sensitivity of these radio waves to interact with water. So we need the atmosphere to be bone dry, uh, and that is given if you go very, very high up uh, on, on a mountaintop or if you go to places like the South Pole or the Greenland Telescope, of course, uh, which is currently at sea level. Um, we uh, hope to find the funding to uh, move it to the Greenland Summit, which would be even better. Uh, but ALMA in particular is a very, very important station. Uh, these 64 dishes are 12 meters each, I think, and, and that is just an enormous collecting area uh, that we're getting. So it's a very important station that makes most of the quantitative analysis that we're doing uh, possible. There are more telescopes uh, in the array. Um, so some of them you saw already, Apex you saw. Uh, there is um, SMT in Arizona, LMT in Mexico, uh, IRAM in Spain, uh, JCMT on Hawaii, also SMA is on Hawaii, but on the next page. Uh, there we go, same mountain. Um, and uh, ALMA telescope you saw and the South Pole telescope. The South Pole telescope uh, does not see M87 and the Greenland telescope never sees Sagittarius A star. Uh, but you know, uh, they tremendously help uh, for the respectively other source. Uh, and there's a lot of institutions on board. I mentioned this uh, over and over again. And this is really a collaboration of uh, many, um, many really driven and really great people. Um, so there's a lot of expertise that comes together. And I want to stress that this is not something that any single person from this group, even from this group, <laughs> uh, could, uh, could pull off on their own, uh, you know, uh, very important to remember. And the future is bright um, because um, right now um, people are in the process of thinking about what's the best way 
to enhance the Event Horizon Telescope Array uh, by additional telescopes uh, such that you know, the science, whatever that may be, gets maximized. Um, you can put more telescopes in certain places and then you can ask with uh, simulations, uh, how good could my image be reconstructed if I had a telescope here or here? And this is a process that gets uh, iterated over and over again. And there are a couple of sites that are being uh, identified that are pretty good. Uh, and hopefully by the 2032 or so, uh, we have um, as many as 20 uh, radio stations as opposed to eight, uh, maybe more. Um, and that will, that will enable a completely new set of science um, that will make us more sensitive to you know, slightly higher resolution, not so much. Uh, we can probe the connection in M87 between the black hole ring and its jet that we've seen for many, many decades understand that situation a little better, and maybe see completely different sources that we're currently not thinking about, um, such as um, when two supermassive black holes come together, maybe. Uh, that could be a, uh, something that a VLBI array like this uh, could pick up, and then we could watch kind of like the stars around Sagittarius A star, how they're dancing around each other, uh, and hopefully spiral in and uh, maybe merge. Um, so there's a lot uh, on the table, um, and I'm trying to emphasize this to my Astronomy students, every time I can, uh, this is a great, uh, a great area for them to get involved uh, because there's something coming, you know, it's, uh, there's improving data and with improving data, there's always something new we can learn. Uh, and, I, uh, and I hope that you now have a, a better idea of why it took us so long, but I can, also, um, I can also tell you that now we have generated a lot of different algorithms and a lot of codes that, that are much more capable than five years ago. And we can now pull this off uh, a lot faster uh, and so hopefully we can turn this around and ask more ambitious questions uh, about, uh, about the universe. And it's only going to get more exciting from here. So uh, I want to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you.